All right. No, oh, hey. While you guys were out monkeying around, you missed a bunch of work at the shop. Check out what you missed. Last time, Bill Goldberg jackhammered the drivetrain into the 1970 Challenger RTSE. This time, it's crunch time to get the beautiful second generation Plymouth GTX in seafoam turquoise finished in time for the owner's arrival. But first, Mark says goodbye to the 1970 Superbird equipped with a Hellcat by taking it out for one last ride. Okay, getting ready to take out the Superbird with the Hellcat engine for the first time. Let's give it a start. Sounds good. First gear, second. There's the supercharger kicking in. Oh, that's wild. <laughs> yeah. Transmission, Silver Sport, six-speed Tremec, feels great. Brakes feel good. Engine's idling nice. That's 75, third gear, nothing to it. About 3,000 RPM. It tracks good. Magnum Force front suspension holding the road nice, even though we got the F6015 polyglasses, it's still holding the road nice. I, I have no doubt that this thing would bury the speedometer at 150 with no troubles at all. Whew, what a handful, good lord. Here we go, third gear, 70. Jeez. Boy, if I knew more about it, I'd, I'd feel better going faster. But I mean, it goes up to 70 so fast, your head, you have to be on this car all the time. You hear that, Rob Ross? You have to be watching this all the time. This thing will get away from you, man. I'm not kidding even a little bit. It's got a 354 Dana in there we got from Mosier. It's a reproduction, a real close reproduction to the original 354 Dana. It's a hook and book, man, hook and book. Yeah, everything came out great on the Superbird, and there were some challenges with it, but I will put the uh, feather in my cap or whatever metaphor it is that uh, says I'm succeeded perfectly. So, you know, the more I'm learning and getting comfortable with the Mopar performance stuff, like the L-Crate engine now and the 392 and the 354, it seems to me that there's going to be a good market for that because not everybody cares so much and they want late model performance, but they want old school look.
For me, maintaining the OEM appearance of a car is because that's kind of the heart of what I do. I wouldn't be the purist that I am if I said, well, let's throw, you know, great big wheels on it and some funky graphics and some weird spoiler or something. I mean, because my heart lies in the OEM and I've dedicated my whole life to bringing cars back or maintaining cars in their OEM condition, original equipment manufacturing condition. I, I like at least a tip of the hat to be the outside of the car looks OE. It looks like a 70 Superbird. You wouldn't know unless you got close that it had a 707 horsepower hell crate engine in it. We had teamwork, camaraderie, all around a car that we love and around a, a brand that we have passion for. Because that's Mopar and that's OE and that's Graveyard Cars. Our friends over at Summer's Classic Cars, we've been over there a few times documenting some cars for them. They're bringing one over for me to take a look at today. I'm gonna actually spend some time with Alyssa on it and teach her some of the things to look at in these situations. Before they do, I've got just a window of opportunity to go down and work with George on the 71 Cuda. This is our convertible 343 speed car, plum crazy with a white interior. Really neat car, but we have some hurdles ahead of us with those quarter panels being it's a convertible car. He's been working on it for quite a while. I think so far you've done floors, rear step wells, under seat pan, aprons. Did you do frame rails in the front? Yeah, even did the front frame rails. So, you know, it was just one of those cars that being a convertible, it got wet inside. And when they get wet inside, that takes a lot of metal out. So it's still a good solid original car, a lot of good stuff on it. But yeah, it's had some panels, had a little bit of surgery done to it. Show, show them what's going on here with the convertible. What makes the convertible a little bit different than the hard top? The hard top, the quarters carry up about up in the angle about this way. The convertible is just a straight, flat line. There is a lot more available aftermarket, like AMD does a beautiful job. They make almost everything that you can imagine, but they're not gonna go to the trouble of making a convertible quarter panel specific to a convertible when there just aren't that many of them out there. So what we have to do is we have to take and modify an OEM full panel, which for the most part is exactly the same as a convertible style quarter panel, except where the roof begins. Let's face it, we don't have a roof on a convertible. So we have to find that point where we trim it through what they call the sail panel area. So my answer is get it the rest of the way off of there, all the way down, take it out, take this whole thing off, do not damage it, don't bend it. We need the original length and shape of it because we may end up using it either again or as a template. This is my first convertible, so I'm nervous. I do not want to make a mistake. So I have to take it off as careful as possible so I can reuse it if I have to, and if not, I can use it as a template on the new quarter, and I'm praying that everything goes back together just right. Today I'm actually gonna work on Manning's GTX's dashboard. Once I get their dashboard all completed, I'll be ready to install all the interior. Uh, that one dashboard is actually the key element because once it goes in, then I can do my eight pillar moldings, upper windshield reveal moldings, the side moldings, and then just kind of work my way right on down into the floor of the car, you know, with seats and carpet, seat belts, and all that fun stuff. Uh, so it's kind of nice having this done. We're, we're kind of on a tight timeline. Uh, they're coming at the end of the week. I tried to schedule a windshield to get in here, so I got to get that dash in so I can get that windshield in and hopefully get this car all put together before they show up. So the first thing that I actually did is I tore the entire dash down, tore all the components out of it, sent the actual dash frame over to Will. Whenever I get it back, I get it in our amazing stand and I start going to work on it. Typically around here, a, a standard operating procedure would be to create up a dash, send it back to our friends at Instrument Specialties. They do, a, obviously you've seen it's beautiful work. And then when it comes back, we're just ready to put it in the car. It doesn't need anything. Right now, the poor guys back there already have probably a dozen dashes from us, and we're a little bit behind on getting this one done, so I just chose to have Dave do it. He's done them before, he knows what he's doing. A lot of the parts we just get from OER, so it's just a, an effort on our part that we wouldn't have had to make if we would have had more time to send it out. 
The original parts were so nice that they just really needed to be cleaned up and polished. Uh, some of the parts needed to be repainted, a lot of the lettering and everything on the dash that, you know, talk about the wipers and headlights and stuff like that were actually repainted, so they just looked brand new. Uh, the really cool thing about the instrument cluster on this car is that the dad, who was the original owner of the car, the son owns it now, put a really cool label on there saying the GTX takes Texaco Havilland 1040 motor oil, which is really neat. So I don't know if it was in case his son was driving it or in case the mom was driving it or whatever, whenever she pulled into a gas station, he wanted to make sure that they put the right motor oil in this car. So I actually wanted to retain that label since his dad put that on the car. So I polished up all the plastic on the instrument cluster so it looks brand new, cleaned up that label and put it back in the dash. Along with all the other original parts, the dash looks fantastic. It's all put together, put into the car. It looks beautiful. Stay tuned. Dave talks about the history and origin of the Hemi engine. Mark and Alyssa document and assess the value of a Plymouth Roadrunner. And we get wise about how to identify and determine which carburetor studs are right for your restoration. The Hemi engine has been around a lot longer than you might think. Hemi is Chrysler's name for their hemispherical combustion engine, which uses a dome shape at the top of the piston for the combustion chamber, rather than some of the other common types, such as the wedge shape or the bathtub shape combustion style chamber. Invented as early as 1901, the hemispherical combustion engine has been in use in one form or another for over 100 years. In 1905, the Belgium car maker Pipe used a hemispherical engine in their car at the time. In 1907, Fiat used a hemispherical engine in their 130 horsepower Grand Prix racer. Chrysler got into the game in 1940 when the Army Air Corps contracted them to develop an engine for airplanes. Chrysler built a V16 engine that was 122 inches long and it weighed over a ton. They called it the XIV 2220, and it featured two V8 banks, a single overhead camshaft, a turbocharger, and a supercharger. The engine took so long to build that most of the planes interested in using it had to move on to other engines. Finally, in July of 1945, the engine had its first test flight in a P-47 Thunderbolt test plane and it blew away the 500 mile per hour record. Twice, the engine outperformed everyone's expectations, but before it could be used, the war was over. And with the invention of the jet engine, there wasn't any need to continue development on a combustion engine. Chrysler took what they learned and eventually made their own smaller car size hemispherical combustion engine, which they named Firepower. This is considered the first generation of Hemi engines and eventually, each of the divisions of Chrysler had their own name for the engine. In 1964, the second generation of Hemi engines was released by Chrysler, and those are the engines featured in some of the most iconic muscle cars in history. So just remember, that Challenger or Cuda you're driving around with a 426 Hemi has a lineage that goes back to World War II fighter planes. So right now I'm getting ready to get the first coat of color going on a Mente's car. A Mente's car is going B7. It's the first time we've done a B7 car here. Uh, so I'm kind of excited to do it because it's a little bit darker than the B5, but both colors are really gorgeous. This is a popular color, so uh, PPG's got this one just dialed down. So I order my three gallons, they send it to me, I mix it up, do a quick spray out to make sure that it looks good, and then we're spraying. Alyssa and I right now are getting ready to take a look at this little Roadrunner. Now, a friend of mine has a classic car dealership here in town. Every once in a while, uh, they'll call us up and say, hey, we got a Mopar. We'd love to have your blessing on. So this is one of those cars. Uh, they've got it sold to a gentleman on the East Coast. 
that he said, heck, since it's already in town, I would really feel good if Mark could give it a look over, make sure it is what it is, um, and kind of just give it like my rating scale. So we're gonna pull it in, raise it up in the air, I'm double check the numbers on the car, make sure that it's all numbers matching. So as you walk around these cars like this, walk the light back and forth. Okay, do you see anything on that half of the hood? Well, I already see there's dull spots and there's a dent. Do you see how they wave? You yes. see the waves in the panel? Yeah, I, okay. I mean, do you want me to put the right here? Right here, right Beautiful. here. Beautiful, and there's a great big one right here. So what do you see when you're standing there and I'm walking along here? Is it, would you say this side of the car is equally as imperfect as the other side of the car? I think this side looks better than the other I side. I thought it looked a little better too. I don't see but, as much wave. But you do see the problems through here, right? Now what that is, is not a dent. It's the preparation yeah. work that I ride the guys down in the body shop like Will, when we're blocking something and we're trying to get it clean and flat and I go, no, I can I can feel it, or I shows up in a guide coat. If you don't take those steps and you can end up with, you know, what I would consider a mediocre type of job. I noticed immediately, look at your Roadrunner decals. Now you recall I just did the Zinks Roadrunner and earlier back in season one, I did the 70 Roadrunner for laser. Yep. It looks at a glance like this is all one decal. It's not, it's 40. Okay. But notice the X, it's on the bottom. Yep. The dust trail is leaning forward at the top, back at the bottom. Uh -huh. Now we'll go look at the door. The X is on the top. It's an easy mistake to make because yeah. the patterns are very similar. You see, this part looks pretty consistent. It does, yeah. This mirror, depending on what we find on the fender tag, probably doesn't belong here. That's a very rare option. Oh, I'm not okay. even sure it was available. I think that it was, but yeah. it certainly probably is an addition because it's a cool addition. People like that kind of stuff. Let's look at the hood just real quick. The blackout on the hood. You notice that the black is really inconsistent. It's splotchy. Like part of it up through here is a matted finish and then it gets shinier down here. Yeah. This trap door was painted probably at a different time than this, the air grabber door and it has the right sheen to it. It, it looks matte? nice. Yeah, the matted look, but it starts getting inconsistent. What was the first year a Plymouth Barracuda or a Dodge Challenger came available with a rear sway bar? Is it 1968, 1970, or 1971? We'll have your answer right after the break. Okay, so what'd you guys think? Did you guys think it was 1971? Because I got bad news for you. It was 1970. The rear sway bar wasn't introduced until 1970, and it didn't, and it became a standard. Yeah, she struggles <laughs> with this right here. What are you doing? It came okay. standard in the TA. I think I hit my mark. Why are you here? <clears throat> the rear sway bar was standard equipment on all A53 Trans Am AAR cars. I knew that. However, in 1971, they didn't build an AAR or TA, but you could still get the S41 option for the rear sway bar. So, don't yeah, thanks, Dad. Thanks yeah. for help. Now that I got the dashboard all rebuilt and installed in the GTX, I'm gonna go ahead and tackle those seats. I got them all rebuilt. Of course, Larry recovered them for us, did a fantastic job, so they're about ready to go. I was able to actually get the seats in. A driver's side gave me a little bit of trouble, but I proved it wrong and I got it in. and that thing lifts up. Watch the dip in that hood as I go up. Oh, God. The whole thing's swelling. And here's the play in the hinges. It's not terrible, but it's not perfect either. It does have the original fender tag. This is not a real loaded car, what you call oh. a loaded car with lots of Stupid. options. There's very, very few options on there at all. Okay. Mo most of the stuff is standard equipment uh, for the most part. But if you start on uh, the left-hand lower corner, that's your E63, it's a 383, we know that. D21 means it's the four-speed. RM23 means it's a Roadrunner two-door hardtop. You could have got a two-door post or two-door convertible in 1970. This is a 23, which means it's a two-door hardtop. The N, the zero, and the E means it's a 383 HP engine. Zero means it was made in 1970, and E means it was a Los Angeles built car. You go up to the next line, EF8. That's our dark green. That's our, I believe it's called Ivy Green. 
Next to that, the H2F8. That is your bench seat, is what the H2 stands for, okay. and the F8 is the color. So it is a bench <clears throat> seat. A lot of people convert those out, put buckets in them later, but this is cool to see because that's original. It should have stayed in there, and I like that. The other EF8 right here is the upper door frame paint. Now, the A15. That's the alphanumeric code for the scheduled production date, when it was scheduled to be built. Okay. That's always a three-digit number. It can never be a four-digit number. Nine being the last single digit to represent a month. The next month was the 10th month. That would okay. have put too many digits there. So they represented the 10th month with an A, okay. the 11th month with a B, and the 12th month with a C. Okay. So what would you say the scheduled production date of this car is? So a. So that's going to be the 10th month. Which is? October. Uh -huh. And then 15th? Yep. So the car was scheduled to be built on October 15th. That means everything that has date codes has to precede that date. Okay. This is the uh, shipping order number right here. Go up again, EF8 green. That just means that it does not have a vinyl top. If it did, it would have the code for vinyl top right there. So this is okay. right. It's true that it is not a vinyl top. This is a G33 mirror right here. You notice the shape of it. it's not a racing mirror. It's a pedestal style mirror that goes right there. The one that you see on the passenger side was an available option if you had G31, but this car isn't a G31. You don't okay. see it on there anywhere. The, the J25, that's your three-speed wiper mode. Okay, so okay. it could have had two speed wipers or the three speed variable wipers like this. Working with Alyssa on the fender tag, it's, this is great for me. I mean, she's actually at the point where she's showing a lot of enthusiasm about learning this business and going over a fender tag and showing her what it means. It's a good moment for me. I'm very excited to be able to have that time with her. N41 is dual exhaust. That's cool. But there's no N42 which would be dual exhaust with bright tips. Oh, okay. If all you have is N41, then originally, the two pipes would have come out underneath the bumper and turned down. Most people don't like that. If you look at the back of this car, you're gonna see the exhaust tips that it was never started life with that somebody added, because it's a cool ad. But that also explains this next one, N95. This was a California car, not just built there, but it was destined to go there. So when we come over here, the quickest way to tell an N95 car is by this breather cap. This is one of the nipples. You notice there's a vacuum cap on it. If I take that off of there, okay. it's an opening. Yeah. They've got it capped off because they didn't get the vapor return line that goes back to the tank, runs along the right-hand frame rail, comes up and stubs into about here, and then you connect it together with a hose. They don't have that on there, so they probably didn't even know what it was. They, whoever restored the car probably yeah. didn't know what it's for, because they obviously didn't go out of their way to do that. Yeah. But that is definitely the sign that it's an N95. Okay. The N96 is this big, beautiful thing here. That's a great option. It's interesting that they chose that option and passed on almost everything else in the way of cool options. Yeah. But I'd go with the cold air induction, too. It's just cool. Yeah. You remember back to Terry Zink's car, right? They popped that switch, that thing came up, oh, and you yeah, got the shark's cool. teeth yeah. on the side of it. Coming up, Mark and Alyssa continue to detail and assess the Plymouth Roadrunner's value. The owners to our beautiful Seafoam GTX finally make it out to see their car. And Will puts the first coat of paint on a 1972 Tawny Gold Duster. This last should be a yellow chromate, not painted with green paint. The weather strips, they look good. The edges, all this stuff, that looks pretty good. Door trim panels, these are probably legendary and they're very nice. They, they look, look great. Yeah, they do. Yeah. So if you take a look here, like the it, the instrumentation, the rally instrument, you'll notice how the chrome's nice and shiny. It's in good shape. The black's nice. The white lettering, that's probably a new reproduction, most likely. Yeah. These in 1969 and back were a real soft knee bolster. These are a rigid plastic, so these are correct for the 70. Oh. Now, otherwise, when I drove it in, I felt like the pistol grip felt pretty good to me. The linkage was right on it. But if it if it has the wrong one, you go up into reverse, you'd hit the dash with your knuckles. So that stuff all looked good to me. I think overall, the interior of the car is much nicer than the rest of the car. Yeah, because you only yeah. found 
I just those things I pointed out. Thing, yeah. It, yeah, we've got the wrong adapter ring. Here. This is supposed to be a matte finish right here. Uh -huh. These are supposed to be a matte. matted finish right here. The rest of it looked pretty good. The door jams need cleaned up. The latches need to be plated and not painted. Some things yeah. like that. But overall, like he wouldn't have to do any of it. He could just go dry that and not be too ashamed. Yeah, I mean. The rest of the things I'd want to do something with. This dash fin looks terrible up here. They've got the same problem. They got this. This was originally a lacquer finish with a suede, and it was very matted finish, again, because of the shine and the gloss. Uh, that tag should have been taken off of there. New rivets put in. Uh, it should have been detailed, painted with the Chrysler logo. Again, just lots of little things. It's when you come here and you get your car and you take it home, it looks brand new. And so this just isn't that. But they also aren't charging the same money. So you got to keep that in mind, too. So far, Mark took the Hellcat equipped Superbird out for one last ride before it shipped to its owner. For the first time on Graveyard Cars, Will laid out a beautiful first coat of B7 on the 1970 Challenger RT. Now, Dave is working on finishing up the Plymouth GTX before its owners arrive, while Mark and Alyssa continue to evaluate a Plymouth Roadrunner before its potential sale to a new owner. You've seen a lot of suspensions built out here. Yes. Right? You see this right here? That's not supposed to be gray primer. That's no. supposed to be a natural finish. These are supposed to be natural finish. These are natural with a mm -hmm. cosmoline look to them on the end, uh, dipped all the way up to the ball joint. Those were just gray primered. Same with that. Yeah, the, the sway bar, these, that's all just wrong. These should have been new ones put on or at least sanded and painted. All of that needs to be redone. Every square inch of it. Needs, that suspension needs to come out and needs to be rebuilt and detailed correctly. That is not a rotisserie restoration. If it was, it was 25 years ago, so it doesn't matter anymore anyway. Okay, let's go towards the middle of the car. So right now inside the booth, we have our 1972 Plymouth Duster. This is the first A-body that we've done on the show. Kind of exciting to do. It goes a nice HY9 tawny gold. God, where's my coffee? Do I have a coffee assistant? There you go, my friend. Oh, thank you. That's my boy. He's good for stuff like that, coffee. So anyways, Mark wanted the pre-paint done in a single stage. Uh, that's got bad news written all over. I've never done a single stage metallic. So it may come a little blotchy, a little streaky. I don't know, I haven't done it before, but I'm gonna do the best that I can to get it laid down and see how the car looks when I get it wrapped up. Thanks, George, that's good. Single stage is pretty easy. When it's metallic, it becomes a problem because when you're doing it in base clear, you can do uh, cross patterns and whatnot to lay out the metallic evenly. You can't do it with this. When you spray, it's like clear in the car I and mean, it's all in one shot. Basically, I'm just gonna kind of pray it looks halfway decent because Mark's gonna give me even though it's a pre-paint if it doesn't look perfect. Okay, so on the four speed, these are the correct levers. That's why it shifts well. That's why everything hit like it's supposed to. If you get the wrong levers or the wrong uh, geometry, things don't shift like they're supposed to. This stuff's all correct. It needs detailed. Okay. They've got some kind of a Zolotone or something to the bottom, but this isn't undercoating. See how thin it is? Oh, yeah. It's some kind of a texture spray. So <sighs> the car should have been really undercoated with a petroleum-based undercoating. Um, it does use the correct 7290 large U joint, so that's good. Let's see if it's a 489 or 742K, so 741K, so that's great. Is it a sure gripper? Yeah, it looks to me like it's probably had a trunk floor put in it. Trunk floor extensions. How long ago do you think the restoration was? Because it's like, older, 10 yeah. or 20 years ago, wow, probably. Wow, really? I would guess, yeah. See that up in there? Look way up inside that wheelhouse. You see how thick that stuff is? It almost looks like undercoating. Yeah. It was undercoating. That was the original factory undercoating up in there. Then they they blasted it or sandblasted or did something. They didn't get all that out of there. But it was supposed to be even thicker than that from the factory. Mm -hmm. So I do think that the wheelhouses are probably original in or outer, although it may have had a small piece somewhere. I don't see it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it had a little piece put in there. It's had some work done to it. It's okay. Do they have 
10 or 20 years ago have these replacement parts. Not all of them. Sometimes you had to get so, used stuff back yeah. in the days. That up there definitely looks to me to be like an original spot weld, original geometry. That's good. The rails. It's hard when they get color on them and stuff, but it does look to me like it's probably the original rails. That's good. Yeah, I see. See these spot welds up here? Yep. Now, we duplicate that, but whenever they did this car, they probably didn't. So those are probably originals. So I just finished painting our 1972 Tawny Gold Dust. Came out streaky as uh, Yeah. Yeah, it's the first one I've ever done. Good thing is it's just a pre-paint. The body work looks good. The lines look good. The color looks good. It looks totally perfect. So I'll bring it out here in the next couple weeks. We'll tear it apart, get it jammed, reassemble the whole entire car, block it out one last time, and then we'll go to base coat, clear coat, where the car will absolutely look perfect when we're done. Graveyard Cars was hatched from an idea my dad had to showcase the wonderful world of Mopars. So true or false, the Graveyard Car series was based off my dad's 1970 Charger. We're gonna have the answer right after the break. Okay guys, we're back. So what'd you think? Was it my dad's 1970 Charger that started the show? No, it, was, it wasn't. It was the 1971 Phantom Cuda, and you all know that, because we followed it for like eight years, eight seasons. So, yep, yep, okay. We're gonna go to the air cleaner stud section of the book. So we open this up and you can see that there are four versions of carburetor studs. Actually a fifth one down here, including the Carter Thermal Quad. That's the carburetor that came out in 71 on a lot of the big blocks and some of the small blocks. We come across these, we say, well, what are they for? How do, how do I know which one's right? Unless I put it in the carburetor, put the air cleaner on it and see how much stud's sticking up or if there's not enough stud sticking up. Just take the first one, this unique looking little one here that has this shoulder built onto it. That's so that when it screws into the carburetor, it can't continue to screw in where it would go all the way through the threads and not be able to take the wing nut off because it would never be tight. When you go to take the wing nut off, the stud would come out. How many people have had that happen? That's because that lock prevents that. So this stud, I believe, looks most like E, the Holly six barrel. So with that, we'll get our tape measure out and we'll see what it has to say about E. Six pack Holly, two barrel stud. According to this, two of them are required, and that's true. If you go out and look at our 446 pack engines, you'll see that there is a wing nut at the back and a wing nut at the front. They both go to two carburetor studs. We know it's quarter by 20, 0. 0.40. Let's see what they're talking about, 0. 0.40. I bet it's this shoulder right here. So I come in here and I measure that stud. The maximum outside diameter is 0. 0.40, and right there you can see 0. 0.40. So, this is a great replica of the original stud. Let's measure the overall length, 1969, here we go. We end up at 2.50. Two and a half inches is the overall length this should be. I go to here and to here, and you can see that that is two and a half inches long overall length. One end of it, the long end after the knurl, is two inches. And you can see that we're within a 16th of being exact. You go to the other end, according to this, it's half of an inch. If you look very carefully, you'll see that that's a half of an inch. So this is the correct carburetor stud on a Holly six barrel. Whether it's a 340 or a 440, six barrel setup on the six pack or the six barrel, it would use two of these on each engine. And that is what I refer to as getting wise. In fact, I'm gonna take Dave Weiss out of it, and I'm just gonna say getting wise with Mark Mormon, so. And don't tell him. Obviously, he doesn't need to know. So to me, this is that anomaly that doesn't have a right answer. Okay, explain what I mean. 1970 Roadrunner, three to three, four speed numbers matching. Look like not a lot of sheet metal's been put on it, so I'm gonna tend to say it was a pretty solid original California car like they're saying it was. Yeah. I would rather have the car in the, in the graveyard 
with the paint falling off of it and the engine seized up and the transmission not working and a rotten trunk floor. I'd like to see all that and address all that one time, be done, you're out the door, your car's restored, it's beautiful, right? The value of the car in that state is a lot less than it is in this state. Right? So I'm saying that if I went out and I tried to find a three to three four speed numbers matching project car, I'd probably pay around 15 grand for it. Maybe maybe even if it was a real solid one, you might pay 20 for it. That's a lot. I just sold a numbers matching six pack GTX for 24. So let's say it needed complete restoration, but you only paid 20. Now you're gonna put $80,000, 70, $80,000 in the restoration. You're gonna be around 90 grand in the car, but it's malissimo. It's yeah. done. It's done forever and yeah. ever, amen. It's the best that can be done to it. There's gotta be something between that and the way it is in the graveyard. Yeah. And that's probably this. Uh -huh. And so it's an it's a math equation. The guy that buys this, if he's gonna pay 60 grand for it, he's gotta know there's really no room to go back financially. And so really that's what I've got to report back to the guy. It probably was bolted to a rotisserie, but the rest of the things on the car don't really reflect it. Overall, I think it's a great car. It's numbers matching, it's three to three, it's four speed. When it comes down to trying to find an EF8 green with a a green interior and a bench seat, and a pistol grip, non-console, non-bucket, just exactly like this guy supposedly had. Yeah. He's gonna have a hard time finding one just like it. So he's gonna have to take some of the good with the bad. So lo and behold, uh, the mangs are showing up. It's D-Day, we're right down to the wire, no windshield. The good thing is, there's actually two inches of snow on the ground. So it's kind of a bonus. So I can actually kind of play that off like, well, you couldn't drive it anyway, even though the windshield's not in the car. So everything's been done. Brakes are bled. Car's actually been driven around the lot a little bit, you know, without the windshield. So we know it's all good to go. So once that glass gets in there, it's going to be good. All right, my name is Jermaine Manning. Mark doing my uh, father's 69 DTX. He bought it at the end of 1968. So it's my father's first brand new car he ever bought. My father was born at 37, so he was 32 years old. My memories of this car was sitting in my uncle's garage and it ended up in our garage and it sat there for, since I was four or five years old, just sitting in the garage. So never heard it run, never took a ride in it. The interior was, I guess water had got in, it was like a messed up interior, but my father loved it. And my mother really, she really loved it. She mostly drove the car and it was just something he wouldn't get rid of. Many people asked him to sell it and he wouldn't sell it. He was talking about racing it and I don't know if I should say this, you know, running from the police in it and <laughs> stuff like that, you know, that he did. And, you know, he, he was racing and stuff like that. My mother said he used to come to come to her all the time, like drive up on her and want to race it. She said she used to race it <laughs> and win. <laughs> he took pride in the car. And even though it looked the way it looked, he, he never sold it. As many people came, he'd pull a garage up and people would just walk up and, Hey, you want to sell it? And I'm like, nah. And I'm sitting there thinking, like, why don't you sell this car? <laughs> we just it's sitting here. My mother passed away first. She passed away uh, September 4th of 2017, and my father passed away about three months later in December. I was getting it restored uh, for them, mm -hmm. and and uh, they happened to pass where they could see it, you know. So I wanted to get it done for them. It didn't hit me until, you know, my father, you know, he said, hey, I wanna, I'll give you this car. Um, you just gotta promise not to sell it. Mm -hmm. So my whole goal was to get it done right, because it meant something to him, and I want it done, you know, to his liking, so he'll like it, he'll be proud of it. You know what I'm saying? I want it back from when he was new, when he bought it new. Yeah. I was like, I, I want the best to do it, mm -hmm. and Mark is the best. When I see, the brightness of it, the color, I mean, never thought it would look like this. It was a big dent on this side, but it's amazing. It looks yeah. amazing. A brand new car. It's a lot of progress, you know. I feel like it's taken a while, but seeing it was just like, you just forget. You know, it's like this euphoric feeling like, wow, like, this is what you've all been doing all this time. And, and then on the inside of it, it's just like, That's wow, gosh. look at this. The first thing we're going to do is take me to work. I'm going to show it off at work. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. He said I couldn't drive the car. Like it wasn't. I'm like, I could drive it to work. No, you're not gonna drive it. No, the you're car. not driving to work. 
I don't have chalk, just send the lines. <laughs> oh, I park it right here. Somebody done moved it. Don't move it. You know, I want to enjoy the car. I don't want to sit there and watch it. I want to drive it, enjoy it. Around my friends, they they test their cars, and I'm pretty sure they're going to make me test this one. But <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm going to put it, you know, I got to see what my mother and they was talking about back then, you know, how fast it was. And I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to test it, scare her a little bit. <laughs> Make her take her seatbelt off and then ride. <laughs> I think with his dad, he was proud. You know, he wanted, he saw something that he wanted, and he liked to be able to go out and get it. This is something I want to provide for my family, and you know, like, and he always bragged about that. You know, whatever he did, if he did something for his family, you know, he did something for his wife. He, this is what I bought this for her. She wanted this house, I bought this for her. She wanted this, I bought it for her. You know, and man, Jermaine wanted a car. I took him out to buy his first car. I took him out, and so like, you know, with this car in particular, you know, it was like his first brand new car. And so, you know, of all the other cars he had, this was like his first new, new car. And, you know, he had an attachment to it. I think he'll love it. I know he would love it. He'll be amazed. Appreciate Mark doing what he did. Mark Warman, thank you. He just made uh, a man happy. You know what I'm saying? He just, he just brought something back to life that, that I didn't realize until I lost my parents. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A long time. Hey, how's it going, boss? I got Manning 69 GTX, a beautiful Q5 car. You're done? Yeah, done. Uh, that mirror that you gave me, I got the passenger side mirror installed. Great. I uh, kind of went over it real quick and hoping you can go out and uh, do some driving I on would it. be so happy I got it ready to do that right now. Yeah, Mark seemed to like the car. You know, he's been watching me build it, you know, all this time, but uh, the real, you know, catch is going to be when he actually gets in it and drives it. Fantastic running driving car. Absolutely loved every minute of it. I mean, that car pulls. Drove it around, put about 10 miles on the car, pulled hard, went out and did some final driving footage, which was really cool, up over my old stomping ground, South 4th Street. Uh, one of my favorite hills, because you can really get going. SPD isn't watching out, but yeah, you can get up to 100 miles an hour pretty easy going over there. I'll say it again, when car starts out good, it ends good. This car had no rattles, no squeaks, no nothing. I mean, I'm driving it over railroad tracks right down here at the mill. Anybody that lives in Springfield knows what those are like. Nothing, not even one, usually we have to work on the exhaust. Accurate builds a beautiful exhaust system, right? But if we install it and we don't put it exactly within a quarter of an inch of where it's supposed to go, it can bang against things. So we usually bring it back and we readjust it. Nothing, so good job, Graveyard Cars. So overall, I think we had a really productive week at Graveyard Cars. We did, it was and a good week. Very nice. What was your favorite thing this week? The most favorite thing you did all week long? Well, I think it was a pretty exciting start getting to send our Superbird home. 707 horsepower, six feet from One of one. It's the only car well, in the, the world with the Hellcat. Well, it's the only one in the world like it. That, that is Absolutely. very true. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. that's a... That was your favorite thing. What about learning on the 70 Road That was runner? actually one of the highlights. I, just, I, I wasn't a, a smart ass. I was very you good were, about it, right? Took my time, tried to teach you things. Will did really great in the paint shop this week. He Actually, this is one of those weeks where the body and the paint is a bit more rewarding than the mechanical end of things because uh, it's not to say they didn't do anything, but Will got the initial paint done on both cars. Dave did great over in the assembly shop. He got the final touches on our super cool 1969. What's the paint code on the GTX? Dad, yeah, just because I don't remember the VINs. Well, we have a whole reason for that, here. though. Not the whole reason. What else do I do here? You read a book and learn how to take a dooski, right? Well, a dooski is a natural thing. You take a dooski, it comes out. It's what it is. You're drawing the connection here. You, 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 you breathe. It's a natural thing. It's involuntary. These numbers should be involuntary to you. They should be voluntary motor skills. That is like bells and whistles. Bells and whistles. So, but if it makes you happy, I'll try harder. Nothing. Sounds uh, good. Nothing makes a dad feel. But you know how much work that is? It's like every single car I have to memorize that many numbers. It's hard, Dad. 